Artcentric Podcast with Rafi and Klee. Hola, you amazing artist. It's Rafi and Klee. And today we're going to talk about stuff. What kind of stuff are we talking about, We're going to talk about when your art discourages you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and this this uh, is actually coming from a one of our rogues, which, by the way, you guys, if you're listening to this at home, we have our amazing rogues here with us. So if you hear us reading comments, that's exactly what we're doing. Because they're chiming in with their amazing insights and questions and stories related to this topic. Um, so we're going to be talking about one specific question from a rogue, a rogue fam member. Um, but also we're going to be branching off into various ways you might find yourself discouraged a la your art or art career and possible solutions to combat those things. I mean, that would be the point of the podcast. This podcast would really suck if we were like, these are the problems. Bye. <laughs> Definitely. Like <laughs> that's not this podcast. No. So let's, let's get into it. Okay. So when your art discourages you, so this awesome question goes like this. I was watching a podcast and the artist was bashing their old paintings they've done and taking them out of their archive and previous works. Have you ever seen backlash from people who have bought their art? Is it even right to do that? And what's a good solution to art that you might not appreciate anymore that people have already bought, right? Is it self-confidence issue or embarrassed of old work issue? Maybe the topic is how to embrace the journey you're on or have had so far to grow and look upon old works in a positive light. That is such a good question, awesome, Cameron. Awesome, right? That, that's an awesome question. Um, I had to fight the urge to be like, who exactly was that that did that? So I could go on their stream and who be like, blah, blah, blah. you shouldn't uh, do that. Yeah, because like, and it's funny because that's a question that we've gotten in the past. And I don't think that we've ever actually like really covered that particular not by itself thing in by itself. Where, you know, in the past, whenever people have asked me like, so what do I do with the old artwork that doesn't sell? And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's it's not, it, it doesn't go bad. And this deals with, on a different level even, work that has sold to, to clients, to collectors, and someone sitting there bashing work that people have purchased. Bashing their own work too, which just doesn't make, there's an issue with a lot of perception in the art world. And the perception in the art world is this work is good. This work is not so good. You know, even when you're looking at your own growth as you exceed in your art career and you start to really master certain techniques, certain new things that maybe you didn't know before, because this entire journey of being an artist is is one of growth. Like the more you do something, the better you get at it. And it's really unfortunate that a lot of people, instead of looking at their old work and saying, yes, this is who I was back then. I love this. This was the ability that I had. What they'll do is they'll compare their newer work to their old old work and say, my work has gotten so much better. Right. I have a difficult time with that because I don't think your work gets better. I think you become better at certain things. Definitely. You um, may refine your work. You might refine it to to reach a certain point that you want to. But if you finished a work of art and you were happy about it, um, using whatever technique, whatever ability you had at the time, that's a snapshot in time of that work. And I think it's detrimental to look at your older work and say that it's, you know, well, my work is better now. That's trash. And especially like from what Cameron was saying in this podcast where he's basically just trashing the old work. And I'm like, if you do that with your own work, then that means that you live in a world where comparatively speaking, whenever you're looking at artwork, you are saying this artwork is good. This artwork is bad. This artwork is is this. Holding it up against the measuring stick, essentially. And that's that's a that's a little that's a little difficult to that's a difficult world to live in because you are constantly going to be looking at your old work and it's not going to measure up 
If you're looking through that filter. If you're looking through that filter, now, because every year that passes, you're going to get better and better at certain things. You're going to get more yeah. disciplined at certain things. You're going to um, <clears throat> determine what you really like in your work and focus a lot on that. Um, Rafi had a written response to this question, which I really enjoyed also. So I was going to read that just to kind of lay the foundation. Um, basically, he had said that's a great question, which it is. And um, I know I've addressed it a few times, but never as its own subject, which we're doing now. And the fact of the matter is that we'll always improve our skill, like you just said, but to bash the heart of what you create. And I love that you used that. The heart of what you create, that's a slippery slope. At that point, you are tying your self-worth to your ability. However, you were a different person back then with a different skill set who was still pouring what you had available to you into your art. It sets unreliable measures of what it means to be successful. Sure, we may grow out of a painting we have done, but appreciating what it took to get there and the willingness to express it, bashing anything, whether it's your own or someone else's work, is only something that a bully would do. And it's true. And bullies are people who carry many insecurities with them and reflect blame on the thing they are bashing. Art ages like wine and older art is a snapshot of a journey. And I love that. And that's the place that I've gotten to. But I, I suffered from this too early on. Not only was I disappointed in my current work for, for a long time, I was especially like not wanting to look at my past work because I was ashamed of it somehow. Like I just wasn't good enough to even be putting it out there. And over time, I've learned to not do that, to appreciate it. And one of the things that's really um, helped me on that journey is to sit with my work, my older work. I don't have much or any of my older work, but to sit with my archive, my pictures of my older work, and to look at it and to really pick out things that I do love about it. Not only does it help you to rewrite that habit, but it also helps you to understand what you really like and what drives you to create um, and, and to be able to focus on that. I, before I knew too much, <laughs> I, my creativity was off the charts when it came to like innovation and creating pieces of jewelry that I'd never seen before. Um, and so that's something that when I, when I sit with my archives, like it drives me to, wow, okay, I'm going to focus on that shape or that quality um, and, and play around with that now that I've expanded my skill set and see what I can do with it. Um, and I think that's a really helpful practice to, and when you're looking at your older work, to sit with it in a positive way and find things that you love about it. I think a lot when it comes to like my perspective on this and the reason that no matter... No matter how much I've grown in technique and in things like that, when I look at a lot of my original work or I look at a lot of my older work, there is a pride in that because that version of me that was extremely insecure um, when it came to his art and putting himself out there and showing his work and um, just doing anything that had to do with an art career was creating these paintings, putting them out there, this art, putting it out there, selling some of it, um, figuring things out, working through techniques, working on pieces that he could not get exactly how he wanted, but he got him to a point where he was proud of it, right? And, and I think of that person and how much I admire that person for putting me where I am now how dare I look at my work, look at the work that that person created and bash it? Right. That would be like going back in time and literally like barging into your own studio and just like tearing your past self to shreds. Yeah, it Can doesn't. It just does not make sense to me, which, which was the reason that when I read this question immediately, I was like, who did this podcast? And where can I find them? Because I, I, I want to talk some, you know, and the thing is that like, that's because that's my perspective. I don't need to talk sense into anybody. People have their own perspectives with it. But I would say like, you know, there's this ego side of that, that you're going to essentially try to make yourself feel better now by bashing the things that you created in the past 
right? right? Like, oh, well, I've gotten so better, so much better that like pff, that stuff doesn't even matter anymore. And it's like, I think a lot of that has to do with kind of the construct of the way that people see value in the world. Mm-hmm. And honestly, a lot of that construct, especially when it comes to art, is just absolute and complete bullshit. Like there, and I know you guys could hear that I'm like on the verge of ranting because this kind of stuff really pisses me off because you should never degrade your work doing stuff doing what we do as artists you're already going to run into plenty of stuff that is going to try and discourage you from moving forward either with an art project or with your art career why in the world would you go back in time and bash yourself when you're still on this journey yeah definitely i resonate hugely with everything you just said and also can you imagine like calling up one of your collectors and being like i'm so sorry that you bought that piece of I've trash i've gotten so me. much better <laughs> like, oh and they'd be like uh i love it <laughs> so many of my collectors so many of my collectors have been there from the beginning a lot of them have been there from the beginning and what they have told me is like i love being a part of your journey i love Um, sitting back and owning some of these original pieces and watching your growth. It's like, it does not lose value. And that's, that's something that is so important to realize. And, and for some people to get through their thick skulls, your art does not lose its value because it didn't sell or because it's older or because you have progressed in your art. You will continually be progressing in your art career. You know, if you're going by that standard, then what you're saying is in 20 years, everything that I'm creating now is going to be shit. What is the point then? Right. So like that's that's where it it just it's like I said, things are going to be discouraging as it is. You don't need to bash your own art. Or who you were as an artist. Or who you were as an artist. Definitely. Ariane said you can be proud of your progress without bashing yourself and your past work. Yes. Definitely. That's absolutely. I totally agree with that. You can be proud of your progress, and we should be proud of our progress and leveling up in our skill sets, right? Diane said, I love the term using bullying as you are bullying yourself. Who does that? Yeah, right. exactly. I mean, and that's kind of like what Clee said. Imagine going back in time and telling this person, yeah, you know, that sucks, that sucks, that sucks. Uh, but keep at it. You know, you're going to get really good. Like, right. how? That's it, Don't show anyone because it's total trash. <laughs> it's, but like, yeah, that would be crazy. Cameron said the measuring stick of success will make you feel like crap when you start to hit a plateau in progression. Yeah. And I mean, and a plateau in progression usually comes along with the idea, that something what Clee said, where you, you start to know too much, right? You can, You yeah. start to take really big pride in like, well, I'm really good at this and like I'm known for this and or I do this. And you kind of, you always, and I'm speaking from experience here, you have to make sure that you don't pigeonhole yourself with what you know. Yeah, exactly. You box yourself in when you know too much and you stay there. It's like you stop taking creative risks. That's another thing that could be extremely discouraging in your art career. It's like you start to get to a point where you think to yourself, I've done all that I can do or like there's no new ideas or any of that other bullshit that people like to say all the time. It's just not true. Sometimes you just got to loosen up and be willing to be an amateur. In my book, that's what I call it. I'm like, I am forever an amateur because by the time I master something, then I'm moving on to something that I don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just keep that progression going because I know that that's where growth is. Um, We all know enough about everything We don't have to, I I think it's hilarious because I've heard artists and I've heard other artists that have told me of artists that have referred to themselves as masters. And I'm like, that you, we are, we are all masters at life. And sometimes we're all shit at it. And sometimes we're great at it. And the same thing is going to happen with art. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason that you're shit at it is because you're trying to do something that you've never done before. And it's easy to stick to the things that you know. 
it's a challenge to do the things that you haven't done. And be willing to be an amateur at it. Yeah. Sarah says no one enters this world knowing how. It's true. Exactly. Exactly. Cameron said the mood, mindset, and energy put into the old pieces is vital to how each artist grows. And the buyer that connected with that in some way, shape, or form to bash that art is a slap to anyone who appreciated it. It's a it. slap to anyone who appreciated it. It's a slap to yourself. It's It just... That whole that whole thing just doesn't make sense to me. It's like I and you know and I understand that because there's a lot of um, uh, I would say back in the day when I was an intellectual artist, right, where I sat and did more pondering and um, debating and discussing with other wannabe artists who we weren't actually like every once maybe I create one thing every three months or something, and then we'd sit there and talk and basically just talk crap about art and like old art and stuff like, and that's, that's this intellectual idea of the debates that happen on whether or not something is good or bad or something is whatever, what is art and what is not really art. Right. And being, being that person that's having that, that was having those conversations, hindsight realizing like that was all insecurity speaking right there yeah. like whenever there is anything like that that comes up where it's like well this is real art or this is not real like a lot of that is just insecurity and it the more you have those discussions or you say these things because the more people that agree with you um the more real it is right and it's well it's like cameron is saying mm -hmm. people could be trying to make themselves feel better about where they are in their career similar to bull or bullying yeah, literally. literally. Yeah. Yeah. Arianne says it makes me sad someone would be so hard on themselves. I mean, you know, I, hopefully they'll grow in that in that sense. Um, it a is lot a of... direct reflection of like self-talk. Like <clears throat> if your self-talk is crap, how you treat yourself, chances are you're going to talk smack about your artwork too and vice versa. Exactly. Kelly said the old version of ourselves is why we are who we are today. Exactly, Indeed. Kelly. And you know, I went through that journey too, right? Of like being ashamed of aspects of who I was as a younger person and decisions that I made before I knew better than to make said decisions. And it's like, that's, I think that's a self journey and a creative journey of like, just know that that person and those creations got you to here, like you said, and yeah. there's, there's really no reason or room to hate on your past self or your past creation. No, no, because it is who you were at that moment. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I look back at that and I'm like, holy crap. It's kind of like what, what Sarah is saying here. She says, could you talk and walk and eat solid food? create beautiful art on the day of your birth? Do you hate yourself for not knowing how on the day that you were born? You know, and the reality is it's like kind of like bashing on your art is like looking back at when you were learning how to walk and the fact that you fell and fell and fell and fell, right? It's like, yeah, you know what? I was was really I was really bad at it back then. What an idiot. What an idiot. <laughs> like I just kept falling and it's like, you, you look back at those moments and you realize that with all the insecurities and all the everything that was stacked up against you, you still created art. You still took that step. Even if you fell down, you got up and you kept going. That artwork is a reflection of that. That artwork is a reflection of your journey to find your voice. That artwork is a reflection. How can you possibly hate on something that is so monumental in your career? Right. Uh, Danielle said, if I connect with an artist, being able to witness early works inspires me. There's a vulnerability that is relatable and human. Oh, absolutely, well Danielle. Well absolutely. Said. I mean, it's one of the things that I'm fa I'm always fascinated by, you know, even like some of what's considered some of the great masters. I love looking at their original stuff, the stuff that they did, maybe even the stuff that they didn't sell, stuff that was in their uh, notebooks or their sketchbooks or whatever. Mm -hmm. I love looking at that stuff because that really is a progression of your journey. Um, and it's just, I don't know, there's, there's, it's easy to judge yourself. And, it, and for a lot of us, that's one of the things that we're dealing with is, you know, dealing with that insecurity of like wanting to be, I don't know, wanting to be taken seriously in the art world and thinking that you have to fit into some kind of ideal of being a master at your craft in order to be taken seriously. And the thing is that 
no matter who it is, there are certain areas that you're going to be really good at. Certain artists, you know, are really great at watercolor. I suck at watercolor. But anytime that I create something in watercolor, I think it's amazing because I'm pushing through that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Maybe in a few years, uh, I'll be much more um, technical about it. I'll be much more educated in how to how to really mix those colors and play around with watercolor and basically just be a little bit more loose with it. And so I know that the degree of the work, the, the, the composition, all this stuff that all, everything that's going to happen is going to be a little bit more deliberate and it's going to work in my favor. But until then, there is no way that I would put down any of the work that got me to that point or yeah. beyond. It just, you know, when it comes to being discouraged, like we got to be very, very careful on the way that we talk to ourselves and when it comes to this particular subject, I think about that. I think about walking into that room in the past and telling that version of you, yeah, yeah, everything you create sucks, you know, but don't worry, someday you'll be better. <laughs> it just, it's... Kid, yeah, Kelly kid. said that old work will be worth a fortune because it will be the early work. Yes, indeed. And Danielle added, imagine finding a never before seen work from your favorite artists as they were just beginning on their path. That's prize. Right? right? It is. It really is. Cameron said, Rafa, make sure you take all your old pieces and burn them because they aren't you anymore like <laughs> they did. Cameron, is that what happened on the podcast? Were they burning their old work? It's so now, dumb. That's re that old car is worth money. That's what it makes me think Call of, Call Victory too. Auto Records. Um, there's <laughs> a difference between right like um like i've burned pages in a sketchbook transmutation by fire if you will because the energy the emotion that was in them was like kind of angsty and made me feel really bad to revisit so i i it became something else but i didn't consider those to be works of art i consider those to be uh, the perfect catalyst for <laughs> the transformation um, through burning them. So that I would make that distinction, right? If yeah. it's something that reminds you of pain or suffering and you want to have that transformational experience, that's one thing. But just burning your previous works for the sake of like, they're not good. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've gotten rid of um, things that, were great they were beautiful but they represented a time in my life that was very painful and once i had worked through the pain having the artwork there it, it just was a reminder of the, the pain the dark places that i was in yeah. and so at that point you know it it needed a re either a refresher or to go somewhere it was because obviously you guys know, like the artwork that I create, it, it could touch on dark subjects, but it is it usually is based on some kind of empowering effect, something that gets you through that journey. And um, there was a period of time in my life where I mostly just created when I was very, very sad. And it was always a reflection of all the pain all the blame all the you know everything that i was blaming the world on instead of taking the reins of my life and so a lot of it made me feel very um not good so it was something that i didn't want around so at that point like i got rid of it now that didn't discourage me and the artwork was beautiful and amazing even though i didn't have the skill set that i have now so it it wasn't there's a reason why that has to do more with emotion than of leveling your, putting yourself yeah. on a pedestal now and being like, back then I was trash. And there's a reason why things like that are generally done in private as opposed to a public bashing of yeah. one's work. Yeah, exactly. Um, Diane said you can call your old artwork antiques and charge a fortune. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Yellow Mel said two different occasions, somebody would tell me that the way I drew birds was terrible, but then both of those people bought the pieces in question. Lol, I cared a lot less <laughs> about yes. mistakes after that. I love that. Yes. Nanu said, I've talked about the watercolor painting I bought for five bucks that was in a guy's mistake bin. It hangs in my office. 
Yeah. I love that. Extempore Art says, I was thinking of having a, mis- a mistakes bin. Someone will like it. Yeah. We've thought of that too. When Rafi and I are experimenting, things get created that we that's maybe not necessarily a complete concept or whatever. And we've thought about adding a section to our site named something like the studio floor. Yeah. This, where And it, it, I, I thought about that because I watched the documentary of two collectors and they would enter an art studio um, and what they would buy was like the scraps left over from a painting or something. A, a concept sketch for a piece. Uh, yeah. Or... And, and it's so like that kind of fascinated me because – Back then, a lot of that stuff I was just kind of like throwing away when I was when I was done with the with the work, all this like leftover stuff I threw away. And so I, I thought it'd be interesting because and then I stopped after that documentary and looked at it. And I was like, holy crap, this is beautiful. Like mm-hmm. a lot of this stuff is really beautiful. Yeah, it's just what I use to create this. And so I've looked at a lot of I've looked at a lot of that stuff. And thought to myself, like, especially looking at some of Klee's stuff and thinking like, yeah, we should definitely have, you know, from from the studio bin or uh, the experimental or, the, you know, off the studio floor. It's like oops paint. It might not be what they were going for, but it's paint. It's still paint. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thomas said, I love looking at my early pieces. They bring back memories of fondness and how simple life appeared at that time. Also, seeing my art when I was a kid is so cool. Right? It really is. Yeah, it really is. In fact, um, my stepdad recently found a sketch that I did when I was a kid. I was probably like 9 or 10. And it, he sent me a picture of it. And I was like, oh, that's so awesome. Little Clee liked sketching people a whole lot. Um, Connie said, what Nanu said, my friend wall is full of collected pieces that no one else wanted. I Googled their signature and their story, and they are mine now. Yeah. I love that. And that's beautiful. I love that. The artwork they burned, said Cameron, was their prized art two years before. And because it didn't sell, oh. they burned it. That sounds See, like it's... that sounds a lot like clickbait to me, too. Yeah. Yeah, Cameron. You know what? There, there's a lot of clickbait crap with, like, the burning of art. Like, when they were, like, minting NFTs, they were like, we're going to burn this art and whatever. And... Whenever there is an art burning, especially nowadays, um, really it's just to get a lot of attention. And, you know, whatever reason they're using for burning it, like, you know, I call I call bullshit on that. Mm-hmm. Um, especially I, that that whole perception when it comes to art of like things not selling or having things for a while, like it just doesn't make sense to me in the art world, especially with the amount of art that's out there and how many treasured pieces are like older works of art. And for some reason we get into this, this product mentality of, well, if it doesn't sell, if it doesn't sell, then I need to put it on sale or I need to do a heavy discount or I need to get rid of this product. Yeah, well, the like, fast-paced world of retail definitely trains us that way. Yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't work that way with art. It just doesn't work that way with art. So, yeah, if they burn their paintings, I call bullshit. That's a some clickbaity bullshit stuff that they were doing just to get more attention. Yeah, uh, I that, feel that way. Yeah. Uh, Extempore said, I've spoken about my past in the art of Extempore art book. I'm considering if to leave it in, but the point is I came to the other side. I wanted to show those going through it can have a creative life. I love that. Thomas said, big thanks to my mother for saving my works when I was a kid. Priceless. That is awesome. That is awesome. Thanks, Mama. Ariane said, I love the idea of a studio floor collection. Right. That's that's something that's been in the works for a while. And um, yeah, I, I have not been dumping or throwing away anything for Nor quite some time. I. So when we have a chance to put that together, we're going to be launching that. And I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Extempore said Maggie Hambling, when asked about her wonderful texture in painting, said texture, no texture, no, texture is painting fabrics. No, this texture is layers and layers of Of mistakes. mistakes. Yeah. I love that. I mean, that's basically what a painting is. A painting is a series of mistakes that lead you to an end goal. 
Um, because for anybody to say like everything I do is perfect from the get go, that's just not how art works. Like we make mistakes. And a lot of times the mistakes that we make in a painting are what lead us to something quite extraordinary. The thing is there comes that point, the more and more that you do it, the more that you realize like, yeah, I'm going to bumble through this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to go with the flow and I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm going to do the best I can, even if it means maybe get this part restarted, maybe do this. You know, you're just kind of like working through the process. In the early days when you're working on something and you kind of screw it up, like you think, you know, especially if you're you're growing as an artist and you don't realize that's just part of the process, you start to criticize yourself for oh, I messed that up, like, you know, I couldn't get that right, or blah, blah, and it's like, no, it's that's not how it works. That's, you learn with every work that you create. Yep. Um, I, I mean, till this day, whenever I sit down to do skin tones for a painting, it's almost like I'm relearning. There, there's stuff subconsciously because I've done it before, but, like, a lot of times I just kind of throw myself into it and try to experiment with something new mm -hmm. um, because I get bored easily. And I get bored with what I know. A lot of the leveling up comes from getting it wrong, right? Yeah. Because when you get something wrong, then you have you have the opportunity to sit and think about, okay, what happened and, like, how can I, like, move forward with this? A yeah. lot of leveling up for me happens with that, Ari even if it's a technical error. Ariane said, oh, how toxic is it to burn paintings? Oh, it's yeah, then there's that aspect aspect too that's probably not good um uh extempore says i only burn art to create the burn marks within the art definitely if it's yeah, part that's of your a technique. art form. that's a really cool technique too yes. to add those the 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 smoke the smoke or waves. burn marks or yeah you're, you once lit a painting on fire with with something to see what it would do to the layers that you oh had yeah on to there. the layers because i wanted it to i wanted it to boil the paint yeah and i wanted to i wanted the paint to have a certain kind of texture and it was trace cool yeah it was um diane said i can't bear to destroy my old creations maybe pack them away in a dark corner but never destroy i worked hard for that shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> True story. yeah i would never destroy them and you know there have been some older pieces that I'm like, okay, well, maybe my feeling on this has changed a little bit and then I'll just tweak it. Like maybe there'll be something that I'm like, it doesn't feel done to me now. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I'll do something. So it's almost like a collaboration between the past, the past me and me now. And I, and I honestly truly just love those pieces yeah totally i love those pieces because they're a little bit of me from the past and a little bit of me now um i do some redesigning and tweaking on occasion too yeah and expanding upon an idea that maybe wasn't quite like there but yeah that's the stuff man yeah um cameron said take a test dropper to any photo of a person and there are colors you would not expect and every type of skin color. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Absolutely. I didn't know you could do that with a, a photo. Yep. Um, to bring those colors out. That's awesome. Jin just said burning watercolors is usually not super top toxic. There are absolutely exceptions. Oh yeah. You're less likely to cause yourself active harm. Yeah. Sure. If I suppose that's the least toxic of works to burn. I mean, everything um, I was burning was super toxic, but you know, I was doing it outside. Yeah, definitely. If you're going to light your work on fire for um, creative sake to see what happens, definitely do it outside. Cameron meant eyedropper tool in Photoshop. Oh. I think you were talking about like an eyedropper. Like just to go in close, like when you magnify, you could actually just zoom in and oh. then you look at the different. Yeah, I pictured dropping like a solution onto yeah. a photograph and no. something no. cool happening. No. I imagine there's stuff, I don't know. But thanks for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nanu said, I did something cool. I made a stained glass cookie jar and I painted cookies on a brown piece of glass and stacked the blue glass on top so it looks like the cookies are in the jar. That's really cool. I love that. That's really And that's really totally cool. the meat and potatoes of experimenting, right? That's amazing. So some of the other things, I think, I think as far as like discouraging yourself, by looking at your past self 
is definitely one of the things that we do. One way is looking at our old art and being like, oh, I haven't, you know, you know how discour discouraging it is to go to a show and you don't sell anything or maybe you sold one thing and then you've had this work for a month or two months and you're like, yeah, I haven't sold this art. Like, it's just not any good. Like, I need to put this on sale or blah, blah, blah. Not realizing that like it, art doesn't, art just doesn't work that way. Like for art to sell, the person that it belongs to needs to see the art, right? So the more you put it out there, um, the more chances there are that that person is going to see it. I've seen, I've had artwork that I've had for three years you know, and I create a lot of work. So a lot of times, like some of that work wouldn't make it out to show. Sometimes it would. Sometimes I would do my setup and maybe I would sell one piece and then sell another piece. And then I, would you know, bring out like a really old piece, you know, and just put it up and people would walk in and they would be like, oh my God, that's amazing. When did you, you know, did you create that recently? There's a lot of new artwork in here and it's like, it's some of the same stuff. And in doing so many shows, realizing that like, oh, it, it doesn't matter what you bring. What matters is what the person sees, what the person sees. Yep. And the person is going to see whatever it is that they relate to in that moment. And really, that's that's the story of art is that the things that are in your awareness are the things that really speak to you in some way, shape or form. So a and rarely, rarely does it have anything to do with your technique. Technical execution. It, it just, it, it's going to speak to you. I, I'll never forget. I remember I, I naysayed you once in the beginning. You created this bracelet called the Impractical Bracelet. I did call it the Impractical Bracelet. And it, it, not my finest moment, but I, like I looked at it, I was like, that nobody's going to buy that. It was a wire bracelet that I made. It had some beads in it and it had a clasp, but the clasp could not be opened because of the way that I wired it. And I was like, whatever, I love it. It's a bangle, it slides on, it has a clasp. The clasp is just for whatever. And I was like, it's the impractical bracelet. And I put it out and I put a tag on it that said the impractical bracelet. And yeah, you had a moment where you're like, I don't understand that. No I don't understand that. Nobody's going to want that. I, I was mean, I was totally, I, I just started with my art. So I was being, you know, and I wasn't selling. This was during the, the four month period where I sold zero. So I was like, nobody's going to buy that. You best believe a girl bought that <laughs> immediately. Me, who loved it? She loved it. I loved it too. I wore it around for a hot minute and then put it on the table. Yeah, Cam um, Cameron's like Rebel Rafi. Rebel. Burn. <laughs> yeah. Ginger said, "Successes have lessons. Failures also have hard lessons. Some failures with acrylics I'll cover with botches and botches of paint. So now it's 3D surface, unrecognizable, and then it's a blank canvas. Exactly. Totally." Jenny said, I do that. I have old paintings that just didn't work or some I hide away and some I just stare at for years. And then one day, bam, I just dive in and do it. They often end up my favorite. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I love, I love that idea of that collaboration with your, with your old, with, with yourself. Past you. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's, that's why I cannot understand looking at your old art and then bashing it. And, and whatever. And like I said before, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that was just a clickbait publicity bullcrap probably thing that somebody was doing to get more attention. Extempore said, never know which piece to bring out. Then suddenly a piece chosen resonates. I'll be changing my display for the third time next week. Everyone likes something different. Definitely. If you're not sure what to bring, just go with your gut feelings. Yeah, just go with your, don't overthink it. When it comes to the art stuff, don't overthink it. You know, because it's all feeling based. And once you get in here and you're like, I think that this show people will really blah, 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 blah. I've proven that to myself so many times with so many shows. There have been so many shows that I've taken pieces out that people were like, oh, you know, that I thought to myself, well, I don't know if this will sell. But, you know, I mean, it's cool and whatever. At least I get to show it off and like talk about it and whatnot. And, you know, like when when we did the comic book convention thing 
I brought out like my superhero stuff, mm -hmm. but then I had this big wall and I was like, well, I'm just going to bring out these three giant pieces. They're really cool looking. They don't have anything to do with the theme here. And somebody bought them, all three of them. Yeah, one dude. Yeah, and there there are other shows that like I brought. I was like, screw it. I I don't I, I don't feel like that for some of them it was like I don't feel like hauling bins. Like I'm just gonna take one big painting, and whatever. At least I'll talk about it or whatever. And then it, it would sell. Yep. Um, as shows where like stuff like that wasn't supposed to sell, right? Yep. Because that's what everybody was saying, and that's what you're telling yourself because it's a small you know sidewalk show nobody's gonna buy a big expensive painting sarah said i brought an iffy piece to a show once it's sold i almost had left it at home that's yep. how it works that's how it works leslie said sometimes paint over older works so the underpainting adds a richness currently my small works are selling more than large you can never tell what and when work will connect and sell yeah it's true and that's the thing it's like you cannot you cannot look at the older stuff and i remember the first painting that I sold at the Pal Fox market that was it was two panels of fence board mm -hmm. about this big and I think I had done a silhouette of you and the painting was just black and gray and oh, I white. Remember. remember I like I was experimenting I wanted to experiment where it looked like you were walking through a field of glass right or of, of blackness and you were coming out of the blackness mm -hmm. and so it was just shapes too it, like it wasn't recognizable as you i took it out and i was like i don't know if anybody's gonna buy this like this is kind of weird or whatever and it was the first thing before the market was even going somebody walked in with their coffee and they're like that's really cool how much is that and i was like that one's 75 they're like all right i'll take it first piece I sold at the market was yep. something that I was like, I don't know if I'm going to take that to the market. And that's the thing. It's like, you got to understand that none of us know what's going to sell. So you might as well just go with your feelings about what you think is going to be really exciting for you to see. Create what you want. While you're there. And if it doesn't sell, don't, don't let that be a convincer that it's not worthy of showing. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sarah's like one man's junk is another man's treasure. <laughs> That's true. Um, some people see junk. Some people see treasure. Diane uh, said, I'm getting ready to rework a few older pieces. I think I'm finally at the point where I can make the designs work. They're not bad, just unfinished. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, a lot of times I'll look at something older and it just, it feels unfinished. And you got to think about that with your, with what's available to you and your technique. I think one of the, one of my favorite things is thinking about Star Wars and the technology that there was when the original Star Wars came out mm -hmm. versus, you know, and, and versus the technology that there is now with uh, certain things and realizing that they filmed certain scenes knowing that that technology didn't exist yet, but hopefully it would exist in the future and they'd be able to add it into the movie. That's really cool. Like that's really, and, and when it comes to art and your art career and not being discouraged, it's understanding that and looking at it in that way. Yes, I'm going to work on it. Yes, I'm going to create this. Yes, I'm going to work on this. Maybe I don't have this ability yet, but I will. Mm -hmm. So I might as well prepare for it now and understand that everything that I'm doing now is what's going to get me there. Exactly. And, and, and that way, when you're looking back, you have that appreciation for where you were. You also appreciate where you are now and you appreciate where you're going right? It's easy to be standing where you are looking at the future thinking that hey, it's not going to work out. You know why I didn't sell anything at the last three shows. Oh, this didn't work out. Um, nobody liked my, you know, you don't sell any art at a show. Nobody liked my art. How many times have I heard people sign up for shows and go do shows and they don't sell anything and then they get discouraged. They're like, well, it's, it's not working for me. And I'm like, right. Yeah. How many shows did you do? Four, five, Six, seven, I was doing shows every weekend for four months before I sold something. I put myself in debt. This is true. <laughs> for four months because I knew, I knew that I was heading somewhere. Even though there was no evidence of it 
you know, the evidence was to the contrary, but people liked the art. They would, they would compliment me on the art. Sure. They weren't buying. That's another thing that I've heard. A lot of people say is like, uh, you know, a lot of people saying they like it, but no, no, nobody's buying. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you're not there to sell the art. You're there to figure out how to talk about your art, right? Not in a way to try and sell it, but in a way where you're enjoying yourself and you're there to share it with people that may like it. Mm -hmm. And if somebody expresses that they like it, there is a big chance that they're going to come back and either buy that piece or buy something else from you in the future. There's an even bigger chance that they're forming a relationship with you that will pay off in the long run. But if you're doing one show and you are basing whether or not your art is any good, whether you're any good or whether you're going to survive as an artist on that one show or that those those two shows or no matter how long you've been doing it and you go and you have a show and you don't sell anything at that show like you cannot base your value on that and that's one of the reasons that I'm constantly saying don't chase the money because if you're chasing the money money is a horrible motivator why oh I didn't sell this work that means it's no good that means I'm gonna f and burn it oh I didn't sell anything at this show that means nobody likes my art that means you know why am I even doing this I should quit it's like you use that way of measuring your success in order to justify not doing it anymore or getting rid of the things that will make you successful. To me, it makes no sense to burn your artwork because that's artwork that you could take out to a show. The more I think about it, the more I'm like, that reeks of desperation. It's almost like trying to send the message like, if no one's buying my work, I'm going to burn it. Like, it's going to be whatever. Like, it's almost like pleading with people to buy it before it's just, it gets destroyed. It's just, it, it seem, it's just kind of leaves an icky taste. Yeah, um, it really does. Linda said, I've often revisited old paintings that were shoved in a corner and brought them back to life, reworking an area I don't like and preserving what I did like. They're now some of my favorites. Yeah, exactly. And Extempore exactly. says, I'm, I'm enjoying the creative challenge of connecting with fellow art lovers, and it's tricky to think I could sell enough but sold last week after years and back in the momentum again. Yep. It's but again, I would say just because you sold the art, that's good. Congratulations on that. Um, I don't want to take that away. Like, congratulations that you sold yeah. art. But remember to not make that the marker of success. Definitely. Right? Because if it's like, well, I did sell some work, so now I'm back into it. It's like, that's great. Take that momentum and figure out a way where you're, you could continue the momentum without having to worry about selling art. Because the biggest detriment, the biggest demotivator is going to an art show hoping to sell art and coming off in that desperation. And yeah. it's, and, and, the, it, and I, and I know, I know that you've already worked a lot on this extempore and like you've been, you've, you know, leaps and bounds and I, and, and all that stuff when it comes to this, but I think it's important to, to keep an eye on that and continue that journey. Right. Because it doesn't happen overnight. And that's, no. that's really, it took me like three years to get to a point where I just really didn't care about the money. I could tell you that in the beginning, for the first two months, I really cared about the money and I almost quit. You guys would not have me sitting here having this conversation with you. Um, I would not be, I, who knows what I'd be doing right now, but I almost quit doing art because I was not making any money. And that's one of the reasons that I'm so impassioned about it because I'm like, don't stop. Don't stop and don't focus on the damn money because all that's going to do is discourage you. You know, when you sell stuff, great, that's bonus. Boom, time to celebrate. I'm, you know, we would celebrate. Clean and I would have uh, imaginary competitions, you know, yeah. at the end of it. If I sold, you know, more in art than she sold in jewelry, then I was like, I win. I'm the champion. <laughs> You know, uh, Ariane said, I love painting over old work that never felt finished. It provides a history for the new piece. It and really does. Jin just said reworking encapsulates where you are now and your evolution over time. Five out of five stars do recommend to a friend. 
Extempore said talking art and life is much more fun than trying to oh, sell it. Oh, yeah. You should not. Your art's going to yep. sell itself. There's no reason for you to try and sell it. You know, I talk about that in the book where I compare, I, I actually list the guidelines to selling, you know, like car salesman stuff, <laughs> uh, all the techniques. Like I list all those techniques out and it's like, can you imagine having to do that? Like, that's one of the reasons that people get so stressed out and they don't want to do shows or they don't want to show their art, right? They'd rather sit behind a keyboard and just, you know, pay for ads or, or all that stuff. Yeah. Because they think that when they go and they do these shows that they have to sell the art. That shit, that, that sucks. That's discouraging because like, how are you going to convince somebody to buy your art, right? Well, it's like, well, you should buy this, you know, because it's the latest model. And uh, right now, you know, and I could knock off 20 bucks and it, you know, it could probably, it, it'll go on your wall really well and it matches your couch and blah, 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 blah. Like, what are you going to do to sell it? When and it, if you don't, I'm going to light it on fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't buy it, I'm going to just threaten everybody. That you find yourself into... thinking about it next week. It'll be too late. Because <laughs> it'll be burned. Um, <laughs> I've never sold a piece of jewelry in my life, and I don't intend to. I'll never try to sell my jewelry or no. anything else. For no, that I don't sell any art. When I go to the shows or go, like, like we said before, whenever we have a show, the one thing that we count on is that we're not going to sell jack shit. We're not going to sell anything. Because that's the way I like it. Yeah, because that way, pressure. yeah, we go, there's zero pressure. We don't have to worry about selling anything. We're like, whatever. It, it's all about the experience. Something happens there that is magical, mm -hmm. you know, that is we have fun no matter what. It takes all the, the pressure off and it takes away the potential of feeling shitty for not like selling anything because you there, yeah. there is there is powerful magic there is in not nothing, selling your there, art. There is nothing like sitting at a show wondering why your art isn't selling and especially wondering, why the hell am I here? It's the suckiest. It, it sucks. You don't want to do that. Cameron's like, the mob didn't come after you looking for their money, Rafi? Well, it must have been a very good venue to be lenient with money. They were... It was the flea market. They let Rafi... They were very nice. They let me... Did, like Basically, I owed them like $900, and it was $120 a week. A weekend, yeah. Yeah. They let him have IOU... I mean, they did write out IOU slips. Yeah, they wrote out, they wrote out IOU slips. And they let him pay, like, when he <laughs> when he started selling, they let him pay it off little by little. Yeah. They were great. It was were, a great experience it, starting The out. flea market was an amazing experience uh, because it was terrifying and... Like I said before, when it comes to that, like, it was great because it was so, you know, people weren't polite. I had people bash my art and I had to work through it. You know, I had to work through it because, like, some people were really not nice about it. And then a lot of people, a lot more people were loved it. Um, but it, I, I think that that's the benefit of having those conversations and putting it out there, right? You're already going to be dealing with that that kind of stuff the last thing you need to do is like criticize yourself at the end of the day and carry that home with you because you didn't sell anything right uh extempore said i think what it's done is it's shown that i'm not a one-hit wonder so if there's a drought again it should be easier but i get what you mean yeah that's a great way to look at it yeah. too and it, and the idea of you being a one-hit wonder is just ridiculous like you cannot be a one hit wonder if you persist. And that's that's the biggest takeaway here is that when you persist, you become unstoppable. And it it's important to look at that. No matter what comes up that might be there to discourage you, if you persist, you become unstoppable. Mm -hmm. That means that when you run into a roadblock, you figure out a way around it, over it, under it, whatever it is that you need to do, and then you move on, and then you run into another roadblock, and then you're going uphill for a while, and you're doing this, and you're doing that, and every single step that you take is getting you somewhere. But it's also understanding that once you get to that somewhere, now there's another somewhere that you're going to want to be, and mm -hmm. you're going to have to take that route. Persisting through it means all of it's going to happen. But really, discouragement is the one thing 
that can kill an art career. And so it's important to look at every single avenue of anything that might discourage you, whether it's family, whether it's finances, whether it is opportunities, whether it is anything, what is especially what you're telling yourself. Um, because you got to have something that is tangible for you to reach for. For me, it's sharing my art, talking about my art. That's easy. I could, I could do that even if there were no venues. I could set up my art outside in front of my house. I could go on a street corner and do a live painting. I, I could do anything and people are going to come up and they're going to talk to me about that's, that's it. I have achieved my goal. And so when we're doing an art show, that's what I think of. It's like showing and talking about my art and my life and proclaiming myself as an artist out into the world constantly. Mm hmm. Cameron said, Hollow Bart Studio would not exist without you guys having a belief in me that I didn't have. And most importantly, that that belief in yourself developed yeah. because of being around people who do believe in you. And so the way people around you are talking about themselves and their stuff and their art and your art also matters. Like, it's good to surround yourself with people who aren't asshats. Yes. Um, as well. And Extempore says, um, oh, geez, the ticker tape is jumping on me. Cameron said, show people how much of an awesome person you are. And they may buy art because of that. I wouldn't buy art from an asshat. Yeah. And I, most people wouldn't buy art from an asshat. And that's such a critical piece of the puzzle. I've actually not bought art from asshats. Yeah. You know, I've it, seen art that I thought was lovely. And then upon discovery that the artist was indeed an asshat. The art, the art changes. The art changes. I'm yeah. like, I don't want to, I don't want to own this person's stuff in my house. Like, I don't want that energy in my house. Extempore's like, how do you go about not caring about the money at all if it's what's paying for things? Or is it more, if I don't care about the money, then the money will come and trusting it. Well, that's, you, that's like trying to trick the you money can't, to come. You can't trick yourself. Um, you know, Rafi and I went the extreme route in the beginning where we had been living in our car and we were willing to do it again. If it came down to yeah. it, we were literally willing to be homeless to keep pursuing what we were doing. Um, if you can alleviate the pressure, the survival pressure by a side hustle that brings you some revenue or, you know, pursuing another artistic endeavor while your main artistic endeavor is paying the bills or however that works best for you to remove the pressure. Right now, um, like with music, for example, we're not at break even as far as revenue earned versus what we've spent to get better on the drums out there. I But I don't care because I'm going to write songs anyway. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's the, the thing about it is, and, and I know, Extempore, that we've had this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, you and I, several times, um, and honestly, I'm going to be honest with you. This is something that you got to figure out on your own because we're all different. Yeah. For me, it was a, a mindset of realizing even now to this day, I will get rid of everything, everything in order to not feel that pressure. Right. So at the end of the day, I'm willing to not pay my bills and I'm willing to tell everyone to F off. You know, if yeah. it comes down to because what matters to me is my peace of mind and the way that I approach my art, because if I am worried about the money and I put myself in a position to worry about the money, um, you know, it's it's it really is a mindset. It really is a mindset at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, I want to I want to pay my bills and I want to keep this beautiful house and I want to keep all this stuff. But I will live in my effing car if I need to, if it means that I need to survive my my transition into a different state in my art career. You know, so it's like it it really is a mindset. We were set up at that time because we did get rid of everything. So yeah. we d had nothing. We had a phone bill that we had to pay. That works for us. Um and like I said, it was extreme. And that's something that's been consistent is like Rafi and I are pretty much always lose, uh, willing to lose it all in yeah. order to keep doing this. If that doesn't work for you, find out what does. Set yourself up some passive income streams and build those over time. That's long-term goals, right? Take a 
take a side hustle so you don't have to worry about it in the beginning while you're launching your art career. Um, figure out what the what the answer is for you. And it doesn't mean it's the forever answer either. No, no. It, it might be the right now answer. It evolves and changes. The, the thing is figuring out that aspect of money, either both, what can I think and what can I do that's going to take this worry away from me? Because mm -hmm. you want to get rid of that effing worry. You want to know that one of the first things that will discourage you is that, right? So it's like you, you got to figure out a way to get yourself to not be concerned and worried, whether it is uh, thinking, you know, whatever it takes, because that's, that's the thing. It's like, a lot of us will say, this is what I want, right? But when it comes to certain things, it's like, you got to realize you, you are willing to do whatever it takes to follow this dream, right? For us, it was, you know, getting rid of everything. And the reason that I say this is because when I had my corporate job, I had two cars and I had this whole thing and I had this whole life, right? And my entire life was kind of spent managing all these things that I was afraid of losing because either a, I was worried about what the neighbors think, or I was worried about losing this because it was part of my self identity and like all this stuff. And so a lot of it, you know, I was constantly worried about money, constantly worried about making sure that I could pay my bills. And a lot of that had to do with the perception of other people. So in my mind, I realized like when it comes to moving forward in my career, like I don't want to worry about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there aren't concerns or like things slow down or, you know, we don't have money raining out of the, from no, the sky. We've been through so many cutting it close financial times that I, it's impossible to even quantify <laughs> how many there have been. You just, keep pushing forward you just keep and pushing honestly forward. the attitude is like well what the hell is worrying gonna do um yeah because that's the problem that the biggest thing is that worry gets you nowhere other than stressed out yeah worrying about something doesn't fix the problem at all like at all um, it, it, worrying is one of the biggest waste of times that there is out there. In fact, if you're not worried, you're more apt to seeing a solution Yeah. than if you're worried. If you're worried, then you're just stuck there. If you're not worried and you're like, you know what, it's going to, it's going to have to work out one way or another, you know, um, it, it, you're more apt to seeing a solution to the problem. The rogues are telling some car salesman the art jokes. <laughs> what do we need to do to get you in this piece of art today? <laughs> Pat's art, you want to see all this arts, features, and gadgets? I'll give you a protective treatment to protect your art for $900. $900. Um, Ginger said, eight lifetimes ago, I was a television sales lady at Sears. I was raising baby brother on less than minimum wage. People would get info from me and then buy at Best Buy. The desperation was palpable. Yeah, Any yeah. amount of please buy vibes resulted in zero dollars and hunger. Got to keep the focus off the payout or that desperation creeps in and grows. Beautifully, yeah. beautifully put, Ginger. Yeah. That is exactly what I was experiencing in the beginning. And like I said, in the beginning, I sold nothing, like absolutely nothing for months. And that time was a crash course of me figuring this out, mm -hmm. right? Because I I knew it, I had heard it, I could feel it, you know, like, don't worry about the money, don't chase the money. And it was my opportunity to either quit or really, really, really get a strong footing in that place where it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about stuff and I'm not gonna be desperate, right? you know? Because when, you know, I want to stand there in my confidence because that's what's palpable, right? If you're desperate, that's what's palpable. Like, like you said, it, it just and it just gets worse. It just gets worse. Just, Take, just go around desperate people. Just spend some time there. Let it, let it. Walk around an art festival. Just take it in. Go into booths. Feel and the just visceral. Feel, feel it. 
repellent nature of it. Cameron uh, said, taking a side hustle doesn't make you unsuccessful. It makes you persist and determined to do what it takes to do what they love. Yeah, yes. Agreed, exactly, Cameron. Exactly. Exactly. And even today, right after how many, however many years of like working for ourselves, um, if it came down to it and a corporate side hustle was the best option in front of me for a time, best believe I would take it. Yeah. Temporarily. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sarah says she loves how you talk with your hands. I <laughs> Thank do you, too, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> Diane said, you guys rock. You hit the nail on the head. You've become my inner voice reminding me what's important. Thanks, Diane. Uh, thanks, Diane. Well, Cameron, uh, hopefully that was a I, good response. I enjoyed this conversation. We, um, in fact, so much so that we actually didn't cover any of the other things that might discourage I think, you. I think some of this got covered. We did touch on some of yeah. these, though. And maybe some of these will become future podcasts or future videos. So that's cool, too. I think, I think it's super important to talk about the things that discourage you. And, and the truth mm-hmm. in, is that when it comes to this thing that we do, there really are so many things that could discourage us because of the fact that this isn't normal. You know, like you're not, you're not going to school and then uh, getting a job somewhere and doing the whole uh, hullabaloo of, you know, which is hilarious because a lot of people talk about like being an artist and, you know, being rejected. And basically when you go into the job market, you got to face rejection, right? Because you go in and you apply for one job and you're hoping to get it and then you get rejected and you apply for another job and then you apply for three other jobs and mm-hmm. you basically work the numbers game. How many jobs could I apply for that, you know, chances are I'll get rejected for most or not? And it's funny because like for most of us, we're willing to put ourselves through that. Right. For a job we don't even want. Right. Because at the end of the day, (laughs) you can justify that to someone else. You know what I mean? Whereas when it comes to an art career and putting yourself out there and you get rejected here and you get rejected there and you don't sell here or whatever. Right. Um, It's harder to justify that to someone else who doesn't understand the art life, but they do understand what it feels like to go into the job market. And it's essentially the same shit. Mm -hmm. Like you're getting rejected over and over. But if you talk about it in that context that you're that's what you're doing, then that makes more sense to them. And And in a way, it can be chasing security, too. Right. Because if you know, if you land a job, chances are two weeks from that date, you're going to have a paycheck in your hand or a week from that date or whatever. Um, And so it can feel riskier to take a chance on yourself. Yeah. Um, But... But that's the, but that's the thing. It's like, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, you know, having a side hustle, taking a job on because this is going to support my art career while I'm figuring stuff out. That's all part of that determination and persistence. Mm -hmm. That is all part of it. It's like being willing to do whatever it takes to push through the discouragement, you know, and even if it's somebody in your ear or you in your ear trying to discourage you. So Mm -hmm. that's, I think that that's, uh, I think that's good enough. Well, (laughs) I, I really did enjoy this and I think we should talk more about, um, the things that plague us in our art careers and how to deal with them. Or as some people say, plague. Some people do say plague. Some people do say plague. I don't know which is correct. I will accept plague. I grew up with plague. It's like plagues. Right. Unless, is there a place where people say plague? Probably. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) Either way, either way. um, Thank you guys so much for listening to this. And thank you guys so much for being here uh, to the rogues for being here and, you know, giving us your input and asking amazing questions Mm -hmm. and giving us amazing responses to a lot of this subject because When it comes to discouragement, there's a lot of things out there that are going to come up and discourage us, whether or not they're outside factors or they're inside factors in our own brain. Um, The important thing is to remember to just persist. Figuring out when it comes to mindset, that's what mindset is all about. Mindset is, I know there's going to be challenges. I know there's going to be hiccups. I know that there are going to be times where I want to quit. 
what how do I need to see this? What perspective do I need to have in order to be able to push through those things? Because they are going to come up, right? It's not unicorn farts and rainbows. Nay. They're going to come up. Challenges are going to come up. You're going to be rejected. You're not going to sell anything. It, it, you know, uh, somebody's going to criticize your work. Uh, you're going to feel stuck uh, doing something. Whatever it is, it's figuring out the mindset that is going to keep you going. That's that's what it is. Figuring out that perspective, figuring out that thought, that mantra. Mm-hmm. That's really all mindset is about is just figuring out what can I do and say that will keep me going, right? Because if you're like, well, if I sell art at this show, then I'll keep going. Then you've just, you've set yourself up for failure. You got to do something that is undeniably beneficial to you moving forward, no matter what happens, no matter what happens. And that's, that's essentially what, changing your mindset or having that mindset to keep going is all about. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think I already said goodbye to everyone. That's okay. (laughs) But either way. Yeah. So this is what it is, you guys. And thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast. This was a, a really interesting subject, all kinds of emotions back and forth for me. And, uh, yeah, if you like this and you've never listened to us before, go ahead and click wherever it is that you need to click on to subscribe to our podcast. And, uh, yeah, that's it. You want to say goodbye, Clee? Good day. Adios.